Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good Friday afternoon to everyone. It is Friday, June the 4th, 2021. It is currently 3.29 p.m. Central Time, and once again, I'm coming to you live from the Sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church, located right here in Ovalo, Texas. Thank you so much for tuning in. I greatly appreciate it. I have noticed lately in our, you know, podcast statistics, there's so many different statistics that I can look at each day, and I try to look at them just to see how we're doing, where people are listening to us from, and I've noticed a very interesting thing. One, we, we I don't know who's listening to us in San Antonio, Texas. Whoever that is, those numbers have definitely increased in San Antonio, Texas. And then I started seeing numbers showing up from Clyde, Texas, which is very, uh, San Antonio, Texas, obviously that's far from the church, but Clyde, Texas is not that far from the church. And I'm like, who's listening to us in Clyde, Texas? So again, it just, it just gives me the location. It doesn't tell me who the people are, obviously, I mean, that would be a very, in, in, you know, invasive, right? That would be, that would be probably taking away people's privacy, but it lets me know, obviously it would be, uh, but it does let me know locations. And sometimes I'll see locations and be like, okay, what's, what's going on there? The other day, like the number, thir- uh, I think it was number three or number four in locations, it was uh, a city in India. And I was like, well, what, what, what's going on there? So it, you never, every day it changes. I'll just give you an example. Let me just give you a quick example. All right, just, just, just to give you a little behind the scenes, just quickly, uh, because what we're going to be talking about is going to be very controversial. So we got to kind of, you know, break the ice here just to give you some information you probably don't care about. <laughs> right? If I look at for, let's see, if I look for today, all right, let's go here. Let's go to geolocation for today. Uh, today, let's see where we have. Um, the number, well, the number one place today is San Antonio, Texas. So I, I, I don't know that San Antonio has never been number one, never been number one. Um, we have, oh, our, we have, uh, is it Brunswick, Maryland? I believe it's Maryland. Um, in fact, give me one second. It's Brunswick. I believe it is in Maryland. Let me make sure here. Uh, see here. Uh, yeah, Maine. I'm sorry. It's a town in Maine. Ma- why did I say Maryland? I don't know why I said Maryland. I don't know what I was thinking. It's Brunswick, Maine. Yeah, I apologize. I Yes, yes, educated in the Texas public school system. So there you go. <laughs> I don't know, Maryland? Why am I even saying that? Okay, I don't know what I was thinking there. Okay, uh, Brunswick, Maine. So that is there. So we have number, uh, so number one's uh, San Antonio, Texas, I, I, no, uh, actually, I just refreshed. Number two is Brunswick, uh, Maine. Uh, number three is New York. Uh, uh, New York just says New York. Uh, then Columbus, Ohio. Alexandria, Vir- Virginia. Then Clyde, Texas. Then Athens, Tennessee. Then Sydney, Australia. And then uh, then we have, uh, and those are the ones that are broken down. And then other is 78.86% is listed as other. That means most of them, we don't have a a direct, clear geolocation of where it's coming from. So that is interesting. Um, But wherever you are, thank you for listening. Yes, I may uh, confuse you, your location with someplace that you're not located in. I apologize for that. But there there you go. So wherever you're listening from, thank you very much. Um, If we look at countries, uh, uh, these are the countries showing up on the list today. Obviously, the United States, India, Germany, United Kingdom, Canada, France, Brazil, Australia, Japan, and Russian Federation, right? So we have a lot of uh, different uh, countries that are listening. So wherever you are, whoever you are, thank you very much. As always, look, if you want to tell me who you are, how you found us, how long you've been listening, feel free to email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That kind of gives me some idea of like who you are. You're like, I'm just sitting in an empty sanctuary talking and I don't know who hears me. I don't know anything. So that that sometimes kind of pulls the curtain back on your side because, uh, well, I try to pull the curtain back and let you know what's going on on this side. Now, let's, now I know what you're getting ready to say. 
You're going to say, well, wait a minute. Why did you spend time doing that? You even messed up the name of a place. You messed up the the state. Uh, you, You messed that all up. Why did you do? That was just a distraction from the subject that I tuned in to hear. You you said you're going to be talking about this subject, and I saw it, and I wanted to hear you talk about it, and I think that that was just all a distraction, and you wasted my time. Get to the point. A lot of people say that about podcasts. A lot of people say that. One of the biggest complaints is when podcasters just turn on the microphone and they do a lot of chit-chat before they get to the subject. A lot of people complain about that. In fact, that's one of the number one complaints about some podcasts. Just get to the point. I'm busy. And I understand that. Also, I understand from a podcasting perspective, you sometimes like to ease into it, right? You also feel like that the people listening are kind of part of, you know, a kind of a community and you kind of want to say, hey, here's what's going on. You kind of want to provide some of that background. But yes, it can be a distraction. Yes. And and, and I know what you're saying. Shut up. You're distracting. Get to the point. I'm doing it on purpose, okay? I think someone someone somewhere just caught on what I've been doing. I'm trying to use this as an illustration because I believe something is happening in American Christianity right now, and I'm going to offer a perspective that I believe probably every Christian podcaster you listen to is going to, would greatly disagree with me. So I'm going to be in the minority of the minority. In fact, I may be in the party of one. It may be just me. I may be in a group of one. It's just me, an army of one. And there's a very good chance you're going to disagree with me. But I believe something is happening right now within Christianity. And I believe it's a great big distraction that everyone is yelling that it's a great big distraction. Danger. Everyone thinks it's a danger. I think it's a distraction. And I'm going to offer my counter perspective. All right. And look, one of the reasons you listen to this program is I tend to differ from pretty much the mainstream Christianity. I try to offer a different perspective. You may listen and disagree with me, which is your right to be wrong. A joke, just a joke. But I think, look, even if you disagree, you should at least consider that there's someone out there trying to offer a different perspective. And I'm, I'm becoming every day more and more convinced about this. All right, now, let's, let's offer some, a, a phrase here, right? I want you to write down, if you're taking notes, because I know some people listen and they take notes, uh, I want you to write down the phrase, critical race theory. Critical race theory. Critical race theory. Critical race theory is in the news. It seems like every day, every time I turn on Christian radio, critical race theory, critical race theory, critical race theory. We got to stand up against it. Critical race theory, critical. We can't let it in our church. We can't let it in our seminaries. Critical race theory, critical race theory, critical race theory, critical race theory. It's like you would think that critical race theory now is the greatest danger facing American Christianity. Now, some people would say, well, that's going a little far. I understand that some people may say that, 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 I'm, that I'm interpreting what everyone is doing in a way that, that I'm making it go too far. But I argue that, uh, that even if people are not saying it's the greatest danger, their actions and the time dedicated to it, to me, indicates that in practice, they do believe it's the greatest danger. And I think critical race theory is becoming simply a distraction to once again distract Christians from what we should be focused on, what the church should be doing, and we're going to become distracted. Or, let me say it, because you know I'm fond of this term, that the whole controversy over critical race theory is once again going to become something that hijacks the church. It hijacks, begins to control the church, and turns the church away from its that its course and its direction that it should be going. We're going to be hijacked and be used, and I think it's going to go coincide with politics. I I don't perceive critical race theory to be as big as a threat that everyone keeps telling me that it is. And I understand, let me make it very clear. I understand that my perspective could be clouded for this purpose. I'm coming to you live from the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church located in the middle of West Texas, nowhere Texas. Clearly in the middle of nowhere Texas, 
critical race theory is not uh, even on the radar of any churches here. It's not a concern. It's not. Now, that could mean that I'm blind to the danger, that the danger is out there and it's coming for us. And I need to start warning people about it now. Typically, I think that way. Hey, look, nobody here right now, you you care about this? You need to pay attention because it's going to become a big issue. But this is one of those things, I just keep scratching my head going, is it really that serious? Is it really all of that? Podcast after podcast. I I can't even tell you how many Christian podcasts I've heard in the last six months. Critical race theory, critical race theory. American Family Radio, critical race theory. It's everywhere. Now, let me just remind you simply what we're talking about. Critical race theory, if you do not know, is an academic movement of civil rights scholars and activists in the United States who seek to critically examine the law as it interacts with issues of race and to challenge mainstream liberal approaches to racial justice. That's a simple definition of critical race theory. Now, critical race theory, as people are so worried about, like people don't want it taught in the public school. They don't want it taught in the public school. They don't want it taught. They don't want critical race theory to be used as a possible hermeneutical approach, that critical race theory should be completely abandoned uh, and not be used in any hermeneutical way. Now, um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go through a little bit here. Uh, add a little bit more here. Um, cri- if you don't know, critical race theory originated in I think somewhere in the 1970s. I was I was thinking around 1975, but I could be wrong. Um, critical race theory is loosely unified by two common themes. First, that white supremacy with its societal or structural racism exists and maintains power through the law, and second that transforming the relationship between law and racial power and also achieving racial emancipation, if I can say it right, uh, and anti-subordination more broadly is possible. Emancipation. I don't know why I'm having so many problems with the word. All right. Uh, So let's go through this again. Critical race theory is loosely unified by two common themes. Right. Here's two common themes that kind of are loosely fitted. White supremacy that white supremacy with its societal or structural racism exists and maintains power through the law. So that's a claim, that there's white supremacy uh, and and with societal or structural racism, it exists and maintains power through the law, right? That to me makes it a more of a cultural issue, right? It's a cultural thing. It's a cultural perspective. It's a cultural philosophy. Now we could argue it's, merits or for or against it, but okay, how is that a threat to the church, right? That, that would be my first thought. Uh, second, that the that transforming the relationship between law and racial power and also achieve, achieving racial, racial emancipation and anti-subordination more broadly is possible, all right? Now, uh, they go on to say crit- uh, critics of, of, ra- of critical race theory argue that it relies on stru- uh, social constructions- constructionism, elevates storytelling over evidence and reason, and rejects the concepts of truth and merit and opposes liberalism. All right? So there's a lot of elements there. Now, just trying to unpack that, you're kind of like, okay, well, wait a minute. What does that look like? So then we would have to get into practical examples. All right? Here's critical race theory. Here's what it claims about this specific situation. This is what it says. This is what it claims. And this is what it proposes how to move forward. Then you could look at that and go, okay, now what should we do with that? I will argue that so much of that is a cultural philosophy about how cultural should culture should move forward, maybe even how education should move forward, but how is that a threat to the church? Now, some people say, but once it comes into the church, it begins to do, it begins to create this idea that the church needs to deal with racism this way, and we must see racism here, we must see racism there, and that we have to do this, we have to do that. We need to interpret the Bible through this lens of racist, uh, uh, you know, the of of the idea of racism existing, and then we may have to change the way we interpret certain passages, and so it can it could create a major problem with hermeneutics. Now, I will argue. Let's just stop right here. To me, the issue would not be critical race theory. 
The issue would be why are we allowing different philosophical concepts to infiltrate our hermeneutics, period? Any kind. Why would we allow a conservative philosophy to infiltrate our hermeneutics? Why would we allow a liberal philosophy to infiltrate our hermeneutics? Why would we allow critical race theory or any other cultural philosophical theory, idea, philosophy to infiltrate our hermeneutics? To me, it's a bigger issue about what we have done with hermeneutics than it is critical race theory. That, to me, is the issue, but we're just going to fight critical race theory. I think you can fight critical race theory all day. You need to stop and look at what we do with hermeneutics all over the place because there's a million problems with how the church does hermeneutics far beyond critical race theory. So critical race theory becomes a distraction where we're not dealing with the real issue. That's why I think it is a distraction more than it is a danger. Let's continue. Let's continue. So there's a definition. Not the best definition, I know, but it would take hours to try to unpack everything about critical race theory, right? But here is why we're talking about this. This was published uh, two days ago. Christian Post, christianpost.com. It was published uh, on Wednesday, June the 2nd, 2021. Headline. Critical race theory sparks flurry of resolutions for annual Southern Baptist Convention meeting. So I want you to hear that critical race theory is sparking a flurry of resolutions for the Southern Baptist Convention, their meeting. Now, so the Southern Baptist Convention is going to meet and one of the issues, one of the primary issues they're going to be focusing on is critical race theory and it's, it's sparking a flurry of resolutions. So the Southern Baptist Convention, the Southern Baptist Convention, a Christian denomination is going to stop, stop what they're doing and meet and address critical race theory, which then elevates it as being so, seen as a major threat and problem. Is that not a distraction to some clear issues going on in the Southern Baptist Convention? Some clear issues doctrinally? Like maybe they need to decide, are they going to allow Southern Baptist churches to ordain women, right? Rick Warren's church did that. Like, are we going to address that? No, I'm not saying they're not going to address other issues. I'm just saying, is critical race theory even worth the time to address it? How serious of a threat is it? Or is it a distraction? Here's what, how, uh, this is the article. And what is shaping up to be a historical annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, we have a listener in Tennessee. The listener in Tennessee, you need to find a way to get into the Southern Baptist Convention meeting. You need to, and then you can give me uh, live reports from the convention floor. That's what you need. We need to do that. Uh, where he can call in and give live. He can put Skype on his uh, phone and he could call us in. So we, we need, we need to, we need to, commission him to go to the Southern Baptist Convention and give us reports because that would could possibly be some very entertaining uh, podcast episodes. Maybe we could pull, I don't, I don't know what he's doing uh, when they're meeting in, in Nashville, but okay. The, this, so let's go on. And what is shipping up to be a historical annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention in Nashville, Tennessee this month. So it's going to occur. Um, okay. Well, let me read this. Okay. I, I was looking for the date here, but they, I don't have the date. I think it's in June. I think it'll be in June. I don't know when. Uh, 2019, I think it was held on June the 11th. So, um, oh, he says his pastor is going. Not sure he can make it. All right, so so our listener who does live in Tennessee, his pastor's going. Oh, man, I wish, I wish our listener would go because it would be awesome to be getting like minute by minute updates, right? He could call because we, I think we can, we can have people call in using Skype here in the Spreaker uh, studio. I've never tried it. Um, Oh, it's next week. All right. So it is next week. Oh, wow. So when my wife is in Boston, that we could be doing all kinds of stuff. All right. Yeah. So it would, it would be interesting just to know, but I'll be watching reports and, and keeping up with it. And so probably next week we'll be talking a lot about this, but here we go. And what is shipping up to be a historical annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention in Nashville, Tennessee this month? The denomination's Resolution 9, acknowledging critical race theory as a useful tool to explain how race has and continues to function in society, is the target of multiple resolutions seeking to strip it of its power. So if you don't know, Resolution 9 was passed... I don't remember when it was passed and somewhere in the past. Um, 
and it acknowledges that critical race theory is a useful tool to explain how race has has and continues to function in society and is the target of multiple resolutions seeking to strip its power. So I would argue, why was there ever a resolution passed in the first place dealing with critical race theory? What does that have to do with the church? What does that have to do with Christianity? What is, it's a cultural academic theory about how to look at race, white supremacy. Remember all those things we talked about in the, in that kind of a kind of a broken definition, not the best definition. We could probably do better, but that's the one I had in front of me. So why do they even, so like by putting it there, then you create all of this turmoil. You create now, so you pass the resolution. Now you got people want to pass resolutions to strip it of its power, which creates again, distraction, distraction, distraction. How serious of a threat is this thing? Now, I, I, obviously our listener, if his pastor is going, then, it, then he means he belongs to a Southern Baptist church located in Tennessee and his pastor is going to the Southern Baptist convention. So our listener would be a good, just, and I know this is not scientific, but he, I, it would be interesting for him to tell me. So Will, if you're still listening, let me know how big of a problem has critical race theory been in your church? Like how concerned is your church about critical race theory? Are your people being infu- in, influenced and, in, you know, is, is critical race theory like being seen as this thing trying to infiltrate your church? Do the people in your church even know what critical race theory is or care? Like how much attention is critical race theory being given in the local Southern Baptist church? I don't think I've had anyone in my church even mention critical race theory. I don't think I've ever had a listener emailed me going, hey, I'm concerned about critical race theory. I'm just, I'm still perplexed how this thing has become this, like, it's the, it is the monster of 2021 for Christianity. It is now our enemy. It's now the villain. It's not that Satan roams about seeking, a, uh, roaming about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. It's now critical race theory is roaming about seeking whom it may devour. And I'm just still perplexed how we got there, All right? Let's see. Right, so this this is uh, what our listener says. Not a problem within our church in any way, but yes, pastor has mentioned it from pulpit that it will be a concern at the convention. I, and so I I just don't know how big a problem. That I, and again, I understand that maybe I'm being so I, I'm being so blind here, and then I'm going to end up looking foolish. But typically, I'm trying to get in advance, going, "Hey, church, we need to be looking out for this." And I. I just don't feel any need to talk about it. I think maybe I've done, maybe I've done a podcast or two about critical race theory, but only because everyone keeps talking about it. And but over time, I've grown more and more just perplexed by it. This the article goes on to say, Denny Burke, professor of biblical studies at Boyce College, the undergrad undergraduate school of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, revealed in a blog post Friday that he was aware of nearly 60 resolutions. I want you to hear that. 60, not one, not six, 60, six, zero resolutions being submitted to the resolutions committee asking the SBC messengers to condemn critical race theory. 60 (laughs) resolutions to condemn critical race theory. I wonder how many resolutions are going to be passed to condemn Rick Warren for ordaining women to ministry. Is it going to be 60? Again, are we more worried about critical race theory than we are a church ordaining women to ministry? How many resolutions? I mean, like, how, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, again, I don't understand the Southern Baptist Convention at all. I don't understand it. That, yeah, its whole structure just makes no sense to me, but that's okay. Um, he goes, I'm aware that a number of people have submitted resolutions relating, relating to CRT or critical race theory. I know, uh, know of at least three that are opposed to CRT here, here, and here, and they give some links, and one that is in favor, a link. And, I, and as I write this, it looks like there are about 57 people submitting the exact same resolution as Mike Stone's proposed resolution. So they have these, they have links to the resolutions that people are proposing. It looks like 57 people are going to pr- propose the same one calling for con- uh, condemning it. It looks like someone's going to pass something or submit something in favor of it. Okay. Uh, Mike Stone, the pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia, and one of the three nominees vying to become the next president of the nation's largest Protestant denomination, 
recently proposed a resolution asking the denomination to condemn the theory. The proposed resolution also seeks to affirm the controversial portion of the November 2020 statement from the Council of Seminary Presidents that states affirmation of critical race theory, intersectionality, and any other version of critical race theory is incompatible with the Baptist faith and message. And these are just the ones I know about because they've been publicized on the internet. I've heard through the grapevine that there are other proposals that haven't been publicized and that we won't know about it until the resolutions committee reports on them at the convention. This means that the committee is not trying to be able, is not going to be able to please all sides and likely won't try to. It also means they have their work cut out for them. Regardless of what happens, Burke expressed confidence that the SBC messenger won't leave Nashville without a strong resolution against critical race theory. Right. So it sounds like it's going to be crazy. Sounds like it's going to be a major, a major point of contention. And I don't know, you know, I I don't, I don't think it would cause a split. I don't think it will. I mean, again, I don't know the politics of the Southern Baptist Convention, but I know this. I just am perplexed that this would get that much attention. And you can go through, I mean, you can read, you can go to the Christian Post and find the article. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just, I'm still trying to figure out what is going on here. What is going on? And so I stumbled upon what may be a clue. Now, maybe I'll be able to make this make sense. Maybe it won't. Maybe it's just going to be a crazy, I mean, maybe you're even going to classify it as a conspiracy theory, but I think maybe there's something to this. Just listen carefully to this. Here we go. Republican lawmakers across this country are advancing bills that, if they become law, would limit the teaching of critical race theory. That is an academic approach that examines American institutions through the lens of race and racism. Here's NPR's Barbara Sprunt. Academics have studied critical race theory for decades, but its main entry into the partisan fray came in 2020, when former President Donald Trump signed an executive order banning federal contractors from conducting certain racial sensitivity training. It was challenged in court, and President Biden rescinded the order the day he took office. But it's since taken hold as a rallying cry among some Republican lawmakers. Critical race theory is a divisive ideology that threatens to poison the American psyche. And that tears people apart. Teaching our children that America is evil. We need to end it, and we need to end it now. That was a press conference in May, where members of the House Freedom Caucus argued the theory divides students by race. States like Idaho and Oklahoma have adopted laws that limit how public school teachers can talk about race in the classroom. Now... Just pay close attention to what I'm about to say. Critical race theory is a political controversy. It's an educational controversy. Let me use another word, political, educational. It's a cultural controversy. Have we allowed a political, educational, cultural controversy to now dominate time, resources, and thinking in the American church that is distracting us from greater issues regarding theology, doctrine, church practice, like ordaining women to ministry? Have we allowed this cultural, political, educational controversy to now become the controversy of the church. And so the church wants to insert itself into this cultural, educational, uh, political debate. Is this a more politically, is this another sign of the political hijacking of the American church? Hey, we're Christians, therefore we've got to do what the Republicans are doing. We've got to do what Trump would want us to do. So therefore we've got to speak out against critical race theory. Is critical race, now you may say critical race theory is a threat to education. You may say that it is, but then you would have to fight that at the school board, not in the middle of a denominational meeting, not from the pulpit, uh, other than telling your people, hey, here's this new theory being taught in the public school and it says this about race and you don't want your kids to hear this so you either go fight the school board or you pull your kids out but you're going to tell me critical race theory now is when you get upset about what's going on in the public school system <laughs> like oh oh no critical race theory that's where i draw the line in the sand of all the other things the public school uh, system does it's critical race theory that's when now it's time to fight i just don't understand the whole the whole thing just seems so like, what are we doing? I just think that there's, 
I think there, this, this is a political thing that's infiltrated the church. Let's go back to the report. And there's movement on the national level, too. Florida Republican Congressman Byron Donald says he's co-sponsoring legislation that would prevent federal dollars being spent on critical race theory in schools or government offices. No matter how you feel about the history of our country, as a black man, I think our history has actually been quite awful. I mean, that's without question. But you also have to take into account the progression of our country, especially over the last 60 to 70 years. But some scholars say the criticism misses the point. I'm not really sure that the conservatives right now know what it is or know its history. That's Andrew Hartman, a professor at Illinois State University who has written extensively about the history of culture wars. The basic premise of critical race theory is that racism is endemic to American society and history. And thus, we have to think about institutions like the justice system or the educational system through the lens of race and racism. Now, let's stop right here. That's making a major claim that basically racism is kind of built into the American culture. You may disagree with it. You may reject it. There's no there's no way to deny its existence in American culture. You can't even deny that you cannot even deny the existence of racism in the American church for crying out loud. OK, we won't even get into the church's support for a lot of crazy ideas in, in American history. You can't get a, around that. Now, what do you do with that? Do you say it's it's been a part of American culture? It's still a part of American culture? Now you get into an argument. How do you fix it? How do you eradicate it? What do you do? You may not like what it suggests. You may not like its theory. You may not like what it proposes. You may not want your kids to hear it, but it's a theory that's out. It's been around, again, for at least uh, since the 1970s. It's not something new. So why did everyone all of a sudden go crazy about it? You know why everyone went crazy about it? Because it became political. And guess where the church, I believe, gets its marching orders? Not from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but from conservative talk shows. Rush, well, Rush Limbaugh, the show is still there, but he's, well, actually, if you listen to the Rush Limbaugh show anymore, they still play clips of Rush Limbaugh. But, okay, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Glenn Beck, Mark Levin, you go you go through the, the, the big names, Tucker Carlson, you know, Fox News, et cetera, et cetera. That's where the church seems to get its marching orders. It's like, oh, 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 that's, it's a problem. Okay, now we've got to address it. We've got to stop it. We've got to deal with it. Now, again, I don't even know what the world the Southern Baptist Convention was. Why would you even adopt a resolution having anything to do with critical race theory? Why would, I don't even understand how it got there in the first place. I don't know why now there's got to be all these resolutions now to condemn it. And it's like, now we're, it's like, here's the world watching the Southern Baptist Convention. And what are they fighting about? Critical race theory. Really? Like, what about all the reports about how many people have been sexually abused and children molested in Southern Baptist churches? Maybe that should take precedent. Remember, that's the whole thing that led Beth Moore into so many fighting with the Southern Baptist Convention because she was so upset about some of those reports. Uh, Also, she was upset with their support of Donald Trump. But that's some of the things that got her in trouble because she wouldn't be silent about some of that. Now, like... Now, I'm not saying they're not going to address these other issues. I just don't understand how critical race theory has become so dominant. It's it's a political issue. Now, again, we could we could debate the merits of it all day. Yes. Put it this way. Here's what I know. Whether it's racism, whatever you want to call it, and every society, guess what is part of its DNA of every society? I don't care what, what it is. It's sin. All right. It's called depravity to see this is the theological way of looking at society. Every society is made up of sinful people who are sinners who do sinful things and promote sinful ideologies and sinful and and will promote things in many cases to benefit them and hurt other people. There's selfishness. There's greed. There's the, the desire for for gain, the desire for power. It's it's built into every society. Every society is at, and at best and moral to, well, especially from a biblical uh, definition, every society is immoral because it's made up of sinful people. So that's the theological perspective. So I won't deny the existence of racism in society because that's just one of many flaws in every society, including America and everything else. But in some cases, if you want to point that out, people get very upset. Now, I, I know that this, I, I, sadly, this also becomes, I hate that it becomes a race issue. 
right? It's like some people who are white, they don't want to hear any discussion about racism. Well, it happened back then. I can't do anything about it. I'm, I'm tired of worrying about it. And there are those who are not white who have a tendency to go, you know what? Anytime we try to talk about racism, y'all get very uncomfortable and want, wants to shut us down and wants to silence it. I, it Sadly, that's where it's, it's, it's turned into. I just don't know how it, critical race theory has become this issue that just is, well, it, it's politics, to me, it's politics creeping into the church. I, I think it's politics creeping into the church. I really do. I mean, there's a million things public schools do. And that and critical race theory, I, I don't even know if critical race, if my, if my child went to a public school and came home and said, hey, we learned critical race theory today, I'd be, I'd be like, okay, so tell me, what, tell me what you think about the theory. So what are, what, what's, what is the, th- I would be asking the basic questions. What is the theory put forth, right? What is the support? For the theory's claims. What is your critique of the theory? What would be your rebuttal to the theory? I would make them try to explain to me the pros and the cons of the theory and talk about it and see how it impacts. Their... I wouldn't even be, I wouldn't even be that concerned with it. Maybe, am I that, am I just being dumb here? I know some, okay, never mind. I don't answer that question. Because right, some people are going to say yes, right, right? Just like when you tried to read the definition of critical race theory and you m- massacred it and messed up words. Yeah, you're dumb. Okay, I understand maybe I'm dumb. I just don't perceive that it, that big of a threat. I'm like, okay, it's just a theory that's that's been part of academics for 40 plus years. Okay, next. You know how many theories and ideas get taught in, in, in the university and in, in, in the academic world? All kinds of crazy theories. Every kind of crazy theory. It's out there. You name it. So, let, you know, now, I don't know if critical race theory actually would ever help resolve racial issues in the culture because I think racial issues in the culture stem from depravity in the heart. So I think it's a spiritual issue more than it is anything else. And my thing is, even if you want to address racism, you need a moral basis by, for condemning it. So what's the moral basis for condemning racism? You got to have first a moral basis for condemning it. What makes it wrong? Who says it's wrong? And if it's your morality who says it's wrong, why, if someone else's morality says racism is acceptable, what are you basing your morality on condemning? Condemning it. To me, critical race theory is, to me, I would welcome it. By all means, let's talk critical race theory. Okay, tell me, oh, so you think America is racist? You think it's a problem? Okay, you know what? I'm not gonna argue with you. I'm gonna ask you a question. What makes it wrong? What makes racism wrong? Well, on what moral basis are you condemning it? By which morality are you condemning it? I would ask for their moral basis for, like, but instead of arguing against critical race theory, I would use it as an opportunity to talk about the issue of morality and where it comes from and who has it and who gets to say what is right and what is wrong. Uh, but I, I'm just perplexed. I, I'm, I'm perplexed on how the first resolution got there, and I'm perplexed why it's now such a big issue within American Christianity. I mean, I've heard it discussed. I think Albert Moeller has discussed it. I think I've heard it discussed on issues, etc. I've heard it discussed on American Family Radio. I've heard it discussed on other lesser known name podcasts. I think, uh, um, I can't remember the name of the other podcast that do kind of a current event. Um, it's Harry Reid is the name of the individual. Um, he's talked about it. I mean, I just, I think every Christian podcast under the sun has done something about critical race theory. And I, you would think that it's like, we're at the Council of Nicaea, and we're arguing against Arianism. You, that, you, you know that we're you know we're arguing for the Chalcedonian definition in church history. We're fighting over like you know we got to save Christianity, and I just don't get it. I I'm, I'm just perplexed. Let's listen to the rest of this news report. He says the political right often points to the progress that has been made since the civil rights movement. Conservatives since the 1960s have increasingly defined American society as a colorblind society in the sense that there were some problems in the past, but American society corrected itself. Eduardo Bonilla Silva is a sociologist at Duke University and says the idea that society is colorblind is absurd. Let's not fool ourselves and believe that we are colorblind now because we are not. And we are not because we watched the video 
of George Floyd. And we are not because we have the data on income inequality, on wealth inequality. He says critical race theory is meant to have an honest accounting and reckoning of the country's past and present in order to truly reach a more equitable future. I wish I could be just a black Puerto Rican navigating America without race affecting my life chances, but race matters. In order for us to get to the promised land of colorblindness, we will have to go through race. It's the opposite of what these folks are arguing. What these folks are arguing is that critical race theory is a threat to society, and they're hoping to sell voters on that message. Christine Matthews is a public opinion pollster and says she sees critical race theory as a growing culture war issue. And so what they want to make the 2022 midterms. Please. uh, Oh, mm, okay. Uh, Will, thank you. He sent me an article in the email. I just I just got the notification. So I'm going to look at it in a minute. But now I've got like. (laughs) <laughs> now I'm trying to calm down because a seizure is going to occur. All right. I'm listening to this news report from NPR and they just re- re- they've described it as a political battle and a cultural issue. So this is what's happening. Politics and culture is infiltrating the church and changing our focus away from doctrine, theology and equipping saints and discipling people and the Great Commission. And it's distracting us because we are becoming preoccupied once again with a cultural political battle. And the Christian church has a history in the United States of America of allowing that to happen. Whatever the conservative politics say, this is a threat to the future of America, then the church takes up and says, we must fight it. But we're not supposed to fight about what's the future threat of uh, of America. We're supposed to be fighting a spiritual warfare, uh, a, a spiritual battle, engaging in spiritual warfare, and we're supposed to be following the Great Commission by teaching, uh, ev- which is evangelism, baptizing, bringing into the church, and then teaching to obey, which is discipleship, and equipping saints so they won't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. We're not supposed to be out there trying to fight every cultural battle. So when I'm listening to NPR and listening to how they describe it, they've described it now as political. They described it as cultural. And it's a cultural issue that is being used by politicians so that the politician can say, this is a serious threat that's going to destroy you, destroy America, destroy your family, destroy your schools, and you better elect me to power so that I can protect you from the big bad boogeyman known as critical race theory. That to me, it's political manipulation. That's what politics always do. You've got to have the bad guy. You've got to have, using wrestling terminology, you've got to have the hill, all right, using antagonist and protagonist, using it from those that language. You've always got to have the bad guy. You've got to have the bad guy. And then the politician comes in and goes, there's the bad guy. I will defeat it. I will slay the dragon. Give me power. Elect me into power. And I will be there to protect you. So for the conservative side, critical race theory now is the monster. It's the invader. It's the terrorist. It's whatever danger that we face now. And if we elect them, they will save us from it. And and I, I don't know how... Look, the world can fall for that, but as a Christian, I I am not going to fall by, from being manipulated to try to get people political power so they can supposedly save me from their, I think in many cases, hyped up bad guy. I don't see how critical, it's just a theory. It's a theory about how we view our culture. Do we view it as, as inherently racist or not? Well, I don't want to view it as inherently racist. Okay, then argue against it. Everyone can acknowledge the racism in the past. I mean, what we, we just went through the anniversary of the horrible massacre that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Tulsa, the Tulsa race massacre. I tell you, it was horrific and horrible. Look at the pictures of what they did to Tulsa. Look what happened. That thing was, I mean, that thing is... That thing is just makes me so angry to even read about it and listen to it. it it's horrible. And I did. A, uh, I told you about the podcast about the Tulsa race massacre that you could listen to that you should have been subscribing to and listen to episodes. You can't deny its history. Now, what do we do moving forward? That's always been the debate. That's always the question. What do you do moving forward? What do you do? What do you do? I understand critical race theory may, may promote things you don't agree with, but man, is it... Is it what I'm worried about being preached in pulpits? To me, I, I, let me say it this way, and maybe you will agree, maybe you disagree. If if I walked into a church and the pa- pastor stood up and he basically preached critical race theory from the pulpit, 
I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I, I would, I, I don't have the money, but I think I could get rich. If I, okay, I would bet you a dollar, all right? If I lose you at a dollar, if I win, I get a million because I don't have a million to put down. So we'd have to do betting in a, in a completely illogical way. But I would bet you a million dollars that if I go into a church and they're preaching critical race theory, right? Preaching the theory, using the theory, preaching the theory, that I could just ignore critical race theory and find probably 25,000 other theological issues way before I got to critical race theory. If they're preaching critical race theory from the pulpit, I'm telling you there's a million. The church has already been politically hijacked, culturally hijacked. They probably they probably have already denied the inspiration of scripture. There's probably a million other issues. There are probably a million other issues. It's like if I drive by, what I've told you when I went to Boston and, dro- and went to Salem with my do- do- daughter, and as we we're driving through Salem, and back to Boston, I don't I can't remember how far it is from Boston to Salem and, and back, but we drive pa- drove past church after church after church, and there would be the LGBTQ flag, there would be the Black, Ma- uh, Black Lives Matter flag, and I'm telling you that when I saw that, it wasn't the fact that it was an LGBTQ flag or a Black Lives Matter flag in front of the church. First, it's the fact that they placed a flag of anything in front of the church. There's problem number one, and problem number two, I guarantee you there's a million theological issues in those church that way before you get to the LGBTQ or the Black Lives Matter. So I don't, I don't, to me, the issues are always biblical, theological. That's the issue. Not critical race theory would only be a symptom of a far deeper problem. And the, and that Southern Baptist convention needs to be worrying about the theological and hermeneutical perspectives that are happening and what's going on in the local Southern Baptist convention. I will, this is I, now, I know this is going to sound radical. I know this is going to sound insane. I would be more concerned the fact that the Southern Baptist Convention supported and it was promoted in Southern Baptist churches everywhere, experiencing God study and workbook that I think every Southern Baptist church in the country went through. The fact that Southern Baptist churches promoted the Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren and that was taught in churches all over the place or the Purpose Driven Life. There's bigger issues going on in the Southern Baptist Convention a million times more important than, than critical race theory. I know, I know people are going to disagree. I think this is a big distraction. And, and I, I will reserve the right to change my mind about this. Maybe, maybe five years from now, four years from now, I'm going to have to come back and go, man, I missed it. I don't know what I was thinking. I know I could be wrong here. So please, uh, no, I just, I just don't see it. But let's finish this report. And then I'm going to look quickly at this email that was just sent to me. About because if you look at President Biden, his approval ratings in the mid 50s, which is significantly higher than President Trump's was ever. She thinks the GOP will use critical race theory to help rally the conservative base ahead of next year's midterm elections. We have seen evidence that the Republican base is responding much more to threats on cultural issues. If Republicans can make them feel threatened and that and their place in society is threatened in terms of white culture and political correctness and cancel culture, that's a more visceral and emotional issue. And I, I do think it could impact turnout. Doug High is the former communications director for the RNC. He says, in some ways, telling schools what they can or cannot teach highlights just how far the party has moved away from traditionally conservative principles, like wanting less federal involvement in schools. What we might have described as conservative policy five years ago, 10 years ago, has really been upended under Donald Trump's kind of reign as as the leader of the party. From a strategy perspective, Matthew says it will all come down to messaging. The Republicans are trying to make it a bad thing. But I feel like if the Democrats got the messaging right, they could make it a good thing. Both sides have a little more than a year to do that. Barbara Sprunt, NPR News. Now, let me say, I think it's funny. We're like, well, you know, now conservatives are going against what they used to be for. Now they want government involvement, telling schools what they can and cannot teach. And before they didn't want that. Here's... 
maybe it's, I'm cynical here. I don't think politi- politics and politicians and political parties have principles that have pragmatism as their dominating philosophy, and they will go wherever the polls tell them to go. They'll take up whatever cause they tell them to take up. Just think about it. There was a time, there was a time that it was conservatives running around saying, no, we need that, that song banned from radio. We need that movie banned. We want to silence this. We want to censor this. We want to silence this. Protest this. We want war warning labels put on music and we all of the you know like you cancel culture was usually more of a conservative almost christian thing now it's liberals who are like silence this cancel this get rid of this because politics it's it's an ever changing it's an ever changing world of simply trying to figure out what message will get you elected it's about getting elected it's not about helping anybody I, that's why i cannot stand politics but So the whole critical race theory, it's a cultural, political time bomb that has infiltrated the church, and the church allowed it to infiltrate the church. And that is the problem. Um, So I I received an email, uh, and it states this, and and thank you, Will, for sending this. He goes, uh, here's an older article from 2019. Apparently, there was a resolution in 2019 that MacArthur spoke out against. And then I think this is Uh, This is a quote. The resolution, meanwhile, strongly underscored scripture as the first, last, and sufficient authority with regard to how the church seeks to redress social ills and promised Southern Baptists will carefully analyze how the information gleaned from these tools are employed to address social dynamics. So, and I think I talked about this in a podcast episode maybe back in 2019. Um, the, The original resolution said, hey, you can use critical race theory. You can look to critical race theory to try to understand what's going on with race and society. However, scripture is the first, last, and sufficient authority with regards to how the church seeks to address social ills. Now, it, it's somewhat problematic because if the church is the first, last, and sufficient authority with how we seek to address social ills, then why are we even going to possibly look at something else? But then I understand that we look at other things all the time. So, Again, why was it even brought up? I don't know. It, it just, it doesn't even make sense. Like if I was in charge of any kind of a denomination, I would never think like, you know what? We need to spend some time considering critical race theory and how we should use it and when should we use it. I, because I would never even have thought that the average pastor putting together a sermon, I don't know, like, you know what? I need to look at some critical race theory today to try to figure out what I need to preach on. I, like, I, I just don't see that happening. Uh, It's a link here to the article. This comes from the uh, Baptist message. Um, And this was published November the 1st, 2019. And it says, John MacArthur rebukes the Southern Baptist Convention stance on critical race theory. Uh, at the During a Truth Matters conference held in mid-October, noted theologian John MacArthur, pastor of Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California, criticized the Southern Baptist Convention for passing Resolution 9 during its annual meeting in June in Birmingham, Alabama. The resolution described two controversial ideologies, critical race theory and intersectionality, in, ne- in neutral terms, suggesting that in some cases both have been misused by uh, individuals with worldviews that are contrary to the Christian faith. Fr- of faith to come to wrong conclusions. However, the two theoretical frameworks actually arose from radicals in academia. Critical race theory is traced to the Harvard Law School, and then they go through some histories here. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the idea of intersectionality is tied to UCLA, um, and they go through some of the issues here. The resolution, meanwhile, strongly underscored scriptures, the first and last uh, issue. Regardless of that, regardless of, uh, regardless of the Southern Baptist saying, you know, scripture is supposed to be the first, last, and sufficient authority, MacArthur said the uh, acceptance of critical race theory and intersectionality was a sign of liberalism taking over the Southern Baptist Convention and called the approval of the resolution by messengers a watershed moment for decline of the denomination. I guess that in some ways it is remarkable that they lasted as long as they did when all other denominations have gone uh, 30, have been gone 30, 40, 50, 60 year, years ago, he said. But when you decide to let culture interpret the scripture and you need cultural clues, cues to translate the Bible, the horse is out of the barn. Now, I, again, I do agree that the fact that the Southern Baptist Convention would even bring it up just is mind boggling to me for, for a number of reasons. One, the local churches are autonomous in the Southern Baptist Convention, so nobody's 
are clearly telling the pastors what to preach, and there's all kinds of wild variations in, in uh, deno- uh, theology within the charismatic church, or charismatic church, within the Southern Baptist Convention, because I've gone to Southern Baptist, uh, Southern Baptist churches that have majorly been influenced by charismatic theology. I've gone to Southern Baptist churches that are very uh, reformed and charis- are reformed and Calvinistic in their theology. And I've gone to Southern Baptist uh, churches that are very Arminian, almost to the point of semi-Pelagianism to Pelagianism. I've gone to Southern Baptist churches that were teaching open theism. So there's a million issues there. So why, so why even bring, like, what do you hope to accomplish by bringing up critical race theory? If the pastors want to use it, they're already using it. They're autonomous. So what difference does it make? And if they don't want to use it, they don't have to use it because, again, they're autonomous and they can make all kinds of wild variations within the Southern Baptist Convention. So bringing it up only creates controversy that that can then split the convention. I, I don't even understand its logic behind bringing it up other than, once again, here's the case where someone was influenced by culture and brought it in. And now people are going to react to that cultural uh, infiltration by then trying to fight against it. But it's all being manipulated and motivated by cultural uh, cultural and political forces, which is problematic and to me. I believe it's a distraction. I think there's a million theological issues in the Southern Baptist Convention. I do. And again, right now, I mean, we have the big one right now with Rick Warren ordaining three women to ministry. What's Southern Baptist Convention going to do about it? What are they going to do about it? Now, I'm assuming it will be addressed at the convention, but if it's if they don't do anything about it, then for all practical purposes, they've told all the other Southern Baptist churches it's okay to ordain women. And if they do something about it, then all the churches who want to ordain women either are going to have to just rebel or it will leave the Southern Baptist Convention, which will ultimately possibly lead to a split. And then you throw in on top of that controversy, which is now you're literally fighting for something biblical. You throw in this cultural, political, academic philosophy and theory to just create more controversy, which just distracts you from the things you need to be to need to be done. I think this is the danger that every Christian face. We live in a world where there's a million different ideas and philosophies that are contrary to Christianity. I understand that. Sometimes they may not even have anything to do with Christianity, but we have to figure out how to understand them and address them and process them. But if we're not careful, we can spend all of our time running around trying to chase every dragon and fight every battle that we lose the focus and the purpose of the church, and we lose our focus and purpose as Christians, and we become distracted. And once we become distracted, when you're, when you're distracted over here by this, then, then in a sense, from uh, using a military analogy, while you're sending all your troops one direction, you get flanked, they, some, they end up coming in in a different way, and then you get taken down and you get defeated. You need a sound strategy. And you need to know how to think these things through. And and there's things that maybe we need to be focused on. And there may be things that really we, it's not what everyone is making it out to be. And then like critical race theory, here's my thought. Critical race theory is the controversy of the moment. Will it be the controversy in 2022? Will it be the controversy in 2023? This is a, a situation where everyone gets upset and, and bothered and distracted and fight about it. And then, and then next thing you know, everyone's already moved on to something else. In the meantime, all the other theological and doctrinal problems have continued to grow and become more and more of a cancer infecting Christianity while this other problem has already went away. I think there's a great potential for that, all right? Now, let me end with this because I do want to try to fix this. I'm going to read uh, one more time, uh, and hopefully I can do, hopefully I can do this a little better than I did the first time. So let's remind everyone: critical race theory is an academic, an academic movement of civil rights scholars and activists in the United States who seek to seek to critically examine the law as it intersects with the issues of race and to challenge mainstream liberal approaches to racial justice. Critical race theory examines social cultural, and legal issues as they relate to race and racism. Critical race, a critical race theory is loosely unified by two common themes. First, that white supremacy 
and its societal or structural racism exist and maintains power through the law. And second, the transforming the relationship between law and racial power and also achieving racial emancipation and anti-subordination more broadly is possible. Critics of critical race theory argue that it relies on social constructionism, elevates storytelling over evidence and reason, and rejects the concepts of truth and merit and opposes liberalism. Now, there, I did a little bit better there. I still messed up a few words, but that's okay. There you have it. I can't make a prediction of what's going to happen in the Southern Baptist Convention because I really just don't. I, look, first, I'm just baffled that it ever got brought up in the first place. Like, why in 2019 would they even pass a resolution? I just I just don't understand what you hope to achieve there. I don't. Now you're going to fight against it with, what, 60 resolutions possibly, maybe even more. It sounds like it's going to be a major topic. The culture right now is all fighting over it. Republican politicians are going to be, I mean, they're going to be using this for the midterm. I mean, it's going to be like, if you don't vote for us, critical race theory is going to destroy your school and your kids are going to be told to hate themselves because they're white and it's the end of the world and, and white people are not going to be able to, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be like, we're three seconds away from Armageddon. Um, and so it's going to, it's going to stay in the main mainstream news. It's going to talk about, be all over conservative media. And I think Christians are going to continue to be distracted by it. In the meantime, all kinds of theological issues are not ha- not only have infiltrated the church, they're spreading and they're spreading and they're spreading. What about Max Lucado? Now, he's not Southern Baptist, but what about him? Now, apologizing for his preaching in the past against same-sex marriages. Isn't that a major, it, more, a more of a major issue in American Christianity than critical race theory? What about uh, Rick Warren ordaining women? I mean, I could go on and on and on and on. What, what about the, the rise of people who within Christianity are quote unquote deconstructing and in many cases abandoning and leaving Christianity? What about the absolute dramatic decrease in the number of people attending church? What about the, the, uh, the um, uh, massive drop of people attending Southern ba- or now Southern Baptist? Southern Baptists have been losing numbers in, in large amounts lately. So is it, it the idea that, oh, let's fight critical race theory because that's a popular topic among conservatives and that'll bring people back to the church? Is that, I just, maybe it's too cynical. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, of all the things I want to warn my people about, of all the things I want to protect people from, I'm telling you, critical race theory is probably not even in the top 50. It probably isn't. And may, and again, I know I could be blind here. I know but I just, I, I just, I don't know. I, 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 there's college students. There, we have college students who attend here. There's a college student in Florida. Sometimes they will email me about what's going on in school. But any, any emails I've ever received from any college student, they don't even mention the issue of critical race theory. They've not even brought it up. I mean, they're, they're critical, they're, they're Christianity and issues that they are struggling with, in many cases, have nothing to do with critical race theory. None. I, and I'm not saying that that's not an issue, but I'm just saying uh, clearly it's, it's being taught on college campuses. Now, I understand from like in helping parents, what do you do? I don't, I don't fight what the world, like, that's the thing. Like, I'm like, oh, I don't want my kid to be taught that. I, I want my kid to be taught the theory. And then we just discuss it and they learn the skill of, critical thinking and how to elevate or how to evaluate a theory and understand its merits, its problems, its justifications, its criticisms, its rebuttal. I, that's, I'm not worried about, Ooh, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. And therefore they're not going to be evil. They're already evil. All right. So my thing is, my job is to teach them how to use their brain to consider everything. I, I, I told you about the church in Abilene, Texas, where the pastor just wanted to get together during the week. I think it was a Thursday, Friday. I don't even know what day of the week. And he was going to send out, he sent out, a, I think like everyone bought, purchased the book. Is it, uh, oh man, what was it called? Oh, it's a famous book dealing with racism, white fragility, white fragility. Um, and he just was going to get together and they were going to read the book. Everybody would read the book then meet together to discuss the contents of the book since it was a hot cultural topic and try to figure out what the book was claiming, what they agreed with, what they disagreed with. And it, boom, 
and people threatened to leave the church. It just turned into like he wasn't even going to use church time. He's like, hey, let's just get together. This is this book. Everyone's talking about it. Let's just discuss. No, we were not going to read it. We're not going to look at it. It's wrong. No, no, we're not. Now, I don't even want to get near it. And, and it's like, well, we're never going to know if white people are fragile or not because they're too fragile to even pick up the book and touch it. It's like you're kind of proving the argument. So that that's the thing. It's like you can't even address some of these issues because it's like, no. How about let's deal with it? Like if someone wants to teach critical race theory, I will. I got no problem listening to him teach it. I not no, I don't, I don't, no not from the pulpit because the pulpit's no place to be teaching it. Pulpit's the place to be teaching scripture. Now, if you're concerned in the Southern Baptist Convention that it's showing up in pulpits, I'm telling you, it's showing up in pulpits because of a problem somewhere else. You need to get to the root of the problem because why would you be teaching it from the pulpit? Why wouldn't you be teaching scripture? Oh, wait, Southern Baptist churches all over the place have turned into circuses and they do all kinds of nonsense. I mean, you know, I I just go back to the Southern Baptist. I remember my first church when I was saved was a Southern Baptist church. I left there because it was a doctrinal joke. I wasn't taught any doctrine, any theology, and all they ever wanted to do is play capture the flag and lock-ins for teenagers and go take me to Six Flags, and it was entertainment, entertainment, entertainment. And finally, when I got out of the Southern Baptist Convention and went to a Lutheran church, I found out that, oh, I found out about the Protestant Reformation. I found out about Martin Luther. I found out about Calvin and Zwingli, and I found out about the, Ni- the Council of Nicaea, and I started finding out about church history and theology and doctrine, and I was given the Book of Concord and other theological textbooks, and I'm like, oh, okay. Okay, wow, that's a, that's a radical different world. Uh, yeah, so to me, that there those are problems that need to be addressed way before critical race theory. But those problems have been evident in evangelical world, not just the Southern Baptist world, forever. But there you go. I think it's a distraction. I don't know how many different ways I can say it. Now I'm becoming repetitive. But there you have it. And I just think that that little clip we listened to from NPR just thought it was fascinating the way they described it. They talked about it from a political point of view, an educational point of view, and a cultural point of view. And I think all of that, the politics and the culture is infiltrating the church. And isn't that always the problem? See 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is a letter written to a church located in a city where the city was influencing the church more than the church was influencing the city. I think critical race theory may be a situation where the church is being more distracted by what's going on in the culture than what the church should be focused on. And that, I think, is the problem. All right, you can email me your disagreement to newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. There you go. I, I, I just know this is going to turn into a bad night Uh, now that I've I've just did this. I probably made a bad mistake to cover this today, but it needed to be covered. So there you have it. And, uh, well, have a great – I think I'm going to do one more thing before I leave. I'm going to try to do one more thing because there is a passage of Scripture I'm just baffled by, um, and maybe maybe we'll do that. Maybe. There's – I got a stack here of things to do. I I literally do. I – I need about 50 hours a day of podcasting and I still would not even cover half of what I need to do. But all right, so maybe I'll we'll be back here in a second. All right, thanks, Will. Very, very helpful, very, very helpful. Um, it's good having people from different theological backgrounds and different kinds of churches because they can, they can help sometimes clarify or help me understand. Thanks for finding that article from 2019. And uh, now we just need Will to go to the Southern Baptist Convention and we need to get, and I could give him my password for Spreaker, and then he could just sit there and give like live updates minute by minute. Okay, all right, here, the, the person is standing behind uh, the podium. All right, here's what they're saying. Ooh, you know, okay, here's what everyone around me is saying. And he could be interviewing people going, so what do you think about this? And what do you, what do you think about critical research? Yeah, it would be, it would be, it could be pretty cool, but there you go. So Maybe, maybe he could uh, convince his pastor to become our correspondent who, who probably would disagree with me on everything. Okay. All right. Y'all have a great day. God bless.